Okay, so tonight we're going to finish this study, Echoes from Exodus, and uh, hopefully you've seen that the book of Exodus goes far beyond the uh, single piece of literature that we have in our Old Testament. It kind of reaches into different directions, and actually tonight I'm going to show you a little bit about how the whole idea of the priesthood uh, reaches back into Genesis as well. And of course, uh, in anticipation of Leviticus and other passages of scripture, we see that the priesthood uh, plays an important part in God's program. And to uh, celebrate that and to honor that role, uh, there are distinct garments that are mentioned in the book of Exodus with a lot of precision on what the priests are to wear. So we're going to take one last look at Exodus tonight, and we've been in this for the last three months, and we have not covered everything. We've only kind of skimmed the surface in some things, and we've highlighted some things that I think will help us better understand Old Testament tradition, how the literature came together, how it tends to echo uh, other things in the Bible, and how it tends to echo even at times things outside of the Bible as well. So tonight, what we want to take a look at is this last part. You see again, one more time, how much of this information on the tabernacle occupies the last half of the book, chapters 25 through 40. So you won't have to look at this map any anymore uh, after tonight, but I want you to keep in mind, once again, chapters 1 through 15 is Israel situated in Egypt after they come to Mount Sinai. Then there's the journey that will then continue into uh, the book of Numbers as it talks about how they journey toward the promised land. So last week, <laughs> excuse me. Last week, we talked a little bit about the tabernacle and its furnishings, so here's another uh, view of that. Last week, we tried to highlight the importance of the different uh, items that are in the tabernacle, and we tried to relate that to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, that each article also has a connection to the ministry of Christ. And this will be true with the high priesthood of, of Jesus as well, being connected in into Exodus in regard to his role as a, a priest. The one thing we did not talk about, and we won't tonight, but it's an interesting topic, is when you get to the book of Hebrews, the priesthood of Jesus is connected to an order called Melchizedek rather than Aaron because the Melchizedekian priesthood is supposedly a greater priesthood than that of Aaron. And the book of Hebrews makes a big deal about that. Uh, that's uh, introduced to us in the book of Genesis, actually, but it's picked up in the book of Hebrews. What we want to look at tonight is uh, the idea, again, relates to the original creation as well as the tabernacle being a reflection of that. So in the last couple of weeks, we've tried to make those connections between Genesis and Exodus. And uh, there are parallels. So even the amount of uh, sections in the tabernacle relates to the way the uh, Genesis creation account unfolds as well. So tonight, what we're going to do is look at uh, the last section of Exodus, and we're going to see that uh, this section here, again, is a repetition of something that has come before. So in this last section, um, we find that the writer is going to pick up where he left off after doing a parenthesis in chapter 32 there was the rebellion where Aaron makes a golden calf and the people uh, are uh, carousing and, and worshiping this golden calf. Moses comes down off of Mount Sinai and um, he uh, breaks the tablets. And so he will receive a second giving of the law, or at least the 10 words, the 10 commandments. 
And we find that God is uh, quite uh, mad at the people as well. And Moses will intervene on their, on their behalf. So what you have, if you look at the, um, the end of chapter, uh, let me move this here. Um, what you have at the end of chapter 32, so take a look at uh, chapter 32. You have the golden calf incident. And then you come down. And uh, at that point, we find a judgment that is placed upon the people. And this whole intervening uh, part here is uh, how God dealt with this open rebellion. Now, how is God going to uh, resume the plan and how is he going to move forward with the plan? Well, if you pick up in chapter 35, verse 1, what you're going to find here is um, the idea of the Sabbath is picked up again. So take a look at chapter 35, verses 1 through 3. It says, Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be a holy day, a Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it uh, must be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So from the time that you have um, the first mention of the Sabbath, you have uh, this, this parentheses of the rebellion, and the, in chapter 35, verses 1 through 3, picks up uh, after that parentheses where God deals with the rebellion of the people. So now, from 35 all the way through 40, there is the listing again of the materials for the tabernacle. You see in verse 4, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord commanded. So all of this is repetition. But what's fascinating to me is that ugly story um, between the uh, instructions about the Sabbath day is now time to be put behind us. It's time to move, move forward. It's time to finish what God has set up. So in many ways, this is a a new beginning, beginning in chapter 35, beginning with the Sabbath regulations, and then all of the materials and so forth uh, concerning the tabernacle and the furniture within the tabernacle is stated all over again, okay? So it's repeated. So what we have now is a new year. So if you just kind of look at chapter 40 verse 1 uh it says then the lord said to moses set up the tabernacle the tent of meeting on the first day of the first month so with the um the erection of the tabernacle it is the beginning of a new era it's the beginning of a new year here is a new people a new beginning uh god has forgiven them for what they've done before now, what we know as we fast forward into the uh, chapters following um, in the book of Numbers, uh, this generation will end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because they rebel again by not believing that God is going to take them into the promised land. So God is picking up where he left off. That's the point of this slide. And what we find is that he's going with full intention to pick up uh, from the forgiveness that was mediated by Moses. Now, Moses, in many respects, is acting like a priest in that episode where he intervenes on behalf of the people. So in this chapter, there is now uh, the beginning of the priesthood. So go. I want you to actually go back to chapter 28, okay? So in the first giving of 
all the materials of the tabernacle. If you look at chapter 28, there is an entire chapter that is devoted to the priestly garments, what they are to wear. If you can keep your thumb there, uh, one of the things that you'll find is that when you get over to chapter 39, okay, if you keep your thumb in chapter 28 and go over to 39, there it's repeated again, okay? Verse 1, um, from the uh, blue and purple and scarlet yard, they made woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary. This is 39.1. They also made sacred garments for Aaron as the Lord commanded Moses. So if you were trying to read Exodus from beginning to end, like we would an, any other book, when you would get to certain parts of it, you go, this sounds familiar. It's a repetition. So you don't really need to read both chapters because it's saying the uh, same thing. But here's what I will do. Let's take a look at one of the chapters. Um, and let's use chapter 28 for the for the time being, because in chapter 28 is the first giving of the garments. So I'm going to read a, a little bit of this, and then uh, we're going to tease it out a little bit and and see why this is such a symbolic uh, apparel. So verse one, it says, have Aaron, your brother brought to you from among the Israelites, along with the son, his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, so they may serve me as priests. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled men to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priest. Now you see the repetition of the word priest is coming up over and over again. These are the garments they are to make, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. And they are to make sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons, so they may serve me as priests. So that's three times in this paragraph that this word priest has been mentioned, uh, and the clothing is to be a symbolic representation of different meanings that uh, are in, in, encapsulated in the choice of different things. So verse six, make an ephod of gold, a blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely twisted linen, the work of skilled craftsmen. It is to have two shoulder pieces attached to uh, two of its corners so it can be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband is to be like, like it, of one piece with the ephod and made with gold, and with pur blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and with finely twisted linen. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in their order of birth. So all of this has meaning. So the best parallel that I think we can understand is um, the royal garments uh, I don't know if you've watched the series The Crown on uh, Netflix, and there's another one called Harry and Meghan. It's kind of telling their story of how they got together and stuff. But it's pageantry, and it is uh, the beauty of all of these garments and so forth that um, shows off the royalty and dignity of the royal family. In many ways, that's what's happening in the priestly garments. It's giving dignity uh, to Aaron and his sons who are going to serve as priests. Now, we would think, okay, we're finally introduced to a priesthood. But what is being played off of is, again, the book of Genesis. When Adam and Eve are introduced in the Genesis narrative, in many ways, they are acting like priests as well. So I'm going to show you tonight two five-minute videos. And the first one is going to take you back to Eden. And what we find is the figure of the high priest who is going to be working in the tabernacle 
in many ways is kind of like a micro Eden that is, uh, ha and he is being uh, re-envisioned um, in the tabernacle. So having said that, let's, um, let's watch this video and, and then I think that'll make some more sense and we'll stop and ask some questions uh, if you, if you need to have clarity, uh, more clarity on this. Okay, here we go. The story of the Bible begins in a garden temple with a couple, Adam and Eve, as God's royal priests. They're supposed to partner with God to take care of creation, and this place where heaven and earth are one is filled with God's blessing. But Adam and Eve were led astray by a deceptive creature and exiled from God's presence. Their vocation as priests is lost. And with that, all humanity descends into violence. But God promises that a new royal priest will come to lead them back into the blessing of Eden by sacrificing himself. So later on, we meet a new couple, Abraham and Sarah. God promises that through their family, the royal priest will come to restore the Eden blessing, not just for them, but for all the nations. And so it's this family that grows to become the Israelites. And they eventually journey to Egypt and then become enslaved under the violent rule of King Pharaoh. So God appoints a man named Moses to represent him to Pharaoh and to mediate on Israel's behalf. Moses confronts Pharaoh and then leads Israel out of slavery and into the wilderness where they eventually come to Mount Sinai. And here God appears to all the Israelites, inviting them to become a kingdom of priests. So he's inviting everyone to be priests, like Adam and Eve were priests in Eden. Right. But it turns out the people are afraid of God and they don't want to come close to God's presence. And so Moses goes alone up to the top of the mountain. And up there, Moses famously gets the Ten Commandments. The first two being worship Yahweh alone and don't make idol statues. And Moses sees some really amazing things up there. First, he sees God's heavenly temple and then also a blueprint of it called the pattern. All right, the plans for the construction of the tabernacle. Yeah, it's designed as a symbolic model of Eden, a place where heaven and earth are one. Then Moses sees something else, the pattern of a glorious human figure. The high priest who will work in the tabernacle. Right, and only this priest can go in and out of the sacred space on behalf of others. He's dressed in white, he wears a crown and is glowing with jewels. He's an image of the royal priest that we're waiting for. And yet the man who's called to be Israel's first high priest is the brother of Moses, a man named Aaron. And while Moses is up seeing all of this, down at the foot of the mountain, Aaron is misleading the people by making an idol statue of God. So the soon to be high priest is breaking the first of the 10 commandments. Yes, and so God gets angry and he tells Moses that he's done with these people. He'll just start over with Moses. But Moses stands before God and he intercedes for the Israelites. He even offers his own life as a sacrifice for their sins. And while God doesn't take Moses' life, he does forgive the people like Moses asked. And so when Moses comes down from the mountain, he's shining just like the high priest that he saw in his vision. It's like he's the real priest that his brother was supposed to be, but failed. And from here, the tabernacle is built. And then Aaron's family is installed to the priesthood. But really, even after this bad start? Yeah, and actually things get even worse. God gives Aaron and his sons really precise instructions on how to act as the priests. And then on their first day on the job, Aaron's two sons violate God's commands. And because they're in a place of great privilege and responsibility, God deals severely. They die inside the tabernacle. Things are not looking good for the priesthood of Aaron. Right, both Aaron and his sons have failed in their priestly role. And this begins to make us think, maybe God's people need a different kind of priesthood. Maybe one that's more like Moses, who surrendered his very life over to God. Yes, and while Moses is great, he also fails to be fully obedient to God. And so both he and Aaron die outside the land promised to Abraham. So Moses was only an image of the kind of priest that God's people will need. Right, we're still waiting for this ultimate royal priest who will intercede like Moses and offer his life for the failures of others. The Israelites eventually make it into the promised land and there they appoint a king and establish a kingdom. Perhaps now God's royal priest can arrive. 
And this brings us to King David. And his story is what we're going to look at next. Okay, so that is the Bible Project. They have a lot of great resources. You can go to thebibleproject.com. You'll see these type of videos and other things that are there. Um, <clears throat> he makes a point, Tim Mackey is the teacher, uh, of, of how what we have already said, a lot of things that are within the tabernacle um, are reflective of things that God set up as a as a tabernacle within the whole created order. We talked about that last week in the book of Hebrews. Then what we find is that uh, looking forward, we find that God wants uh, all his people to be priests in the sense of people that intervene and represent God and that type of thing. So in chapter 28, this these garments um, are to highlight and to um, elevate in many respects this temporary priesthood that will then be um, fulfilled in the person of Christ much later. But all of that is kind of built upon Adam and Eve being the first priests, if you will, that intervene on behalf of the entire created, created order. So the priests are in some ways fulfilling um, a, a representation on earth of what God is doing throughout the whole cosmos. So again, a lot of these are big, broad, uh, bold uh, brushstrokes uh, that take some effort to try to understand. That's why the writer of Hebrews tries to keep taking all this material and saying that was for then, but all of this is fulfilled in Christ. So video number one kind of introduces that. Video number two here follows up on that first video. Uh, and it kind of um, it kind of elaborates a little bit more. So let's watch it at this time. So if you lived in ancient Israel, one of the most important places was the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a sacred tent that the Israelites carried as they journeyed to the promised land. And it was sacred because it's where the heavenly presence of Israel's God lived on earth. And the tabernacle had an important design to show just how special it was. There's the outer courtyard, then an entry room into the tent, and it leads into the center of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, God's personal throne room, and it's guarded by these heavenly hybrid creatures called cherubim. Notice, the closer that you get to the center, the more sacred the space becomes. The people who work in the tabernacle are called priests, and they care for the sacred space, offer sacrifices on behalf of Israel, and announce God's blessing over the people. Yeah, these priests represent God to the people, and they represent the people to God. So think of both the tabernacle and the priests who work in it like gateways that link together heaven and earth. And this is why the tabernacle was eventually brought up to settle on a mountain, because mountains are where earth meets heaven. Now, one thing that's missing in this tabernacle that you would find in every other ancient holy space are idol images that physically represent the God. Oh right, Israel's God explicitly commanded them to not make any idol images. And that's because in the Bible, all humanity is God's image. This is what we learn in the first pages of the Bible, where Adam and Eve, in Hebrew their names mean human and life, they're called God's image, which means they represent God in his holy space. And that holy space is a garden in a land called Eden. Yes, and the story is designed to show that Eden is the reality that the later tabernacle symbolized and pointed back to. For example, look close at the descriptions of Eden. There's the larger region on the land that's called Eden, but then within Eden, God plants a garden. And then in the center of that garden, God plants the tree of life. The design of Eden matches the tabernacle design. Yes. And there are details in the Eden story that are developed much later in the Bible showing how Eden is on a high mountain. Because they're in a place where earth meets heaven. Exactly. And God tells these humans to work and to keep the garden. 
these are the same words that are used later in the Bible to describe what priests do in the tabernacle. So Adam and Eve are God's image and are like priests working and worshiping in a type of heaven on earth temple. Yes, they represent creation before God, and as God's image, they represent God to all of creation. And they do all of this in this sacred space that's saturated with the life and presence of God. And so God tells them to rule creation on his behalf. They're like priests who embody God's heavenly wisdom and rule here on earth. You could call them royal priests. Exactly. Now, this whole setup, the royal priests in God's presence where there's abundance and life, in the book of Genesis, this is called God's blessing. But it doesn't last very long. No. Humanity is deceived by this rebellious creature. They're unsatisfied with being images of God, and so they make a grab at being God, ruling creation on their own terms. And so God exiles them from the garden. And God places Kerovim at the door of Eden to guard the way back in. This is tragic. Humanity has given up the role God made them for. But it's not the end. The rest of the biblical story is about God's mission to undo this tragedy so that humans can regain access to the heaven on earth place where they can finally become God's royal priests. It all begins with a promise that God makes to Adam and Eve that he will raise up one of their descendants to rule over and defeat that deceiver. God says that this coming descendant will strike the head of that deceiver, but also be struck by it. So this priestly figure will restore God's blessing by offering up his own life like a sacrifice. But this is still just a promise. Yes, and so in the next story, we find the next generation outside of Eden. Two brothers at the door of the garden are offering sacrifices to God, kind of like priests. Maybe God will accept these offerings and they can get back into Eden. But sadly, one brother, Cain, gets angry because God favors his brother Abel's sacrifice. And so Cain murders his own brother. Then Cain is exiled even further from Eden and from God's blessing. And over time, Cain's anger plunges humanity into widespread violence. Humans really need that coming royal priest to rescue them. Yes, and that's the hope that this whole story is designed to generate. And so in the next few videos, we're going to explore the theme of this coming royal priest throughout the story of the Bible. We're going to see how the stories of Abraham and Moses and David all point forward to Jesus, who is the ultimate royal priest. Jesus, the one who will restore the blessings of Eden so that all humanity can become the royal priests that we're made to be, ruling the world together on God's behalf. Okay, let's stop there. Uh, these two videos, I think, do a, a good job of summarizing some of the connections back to uh, Genesis. Uh, but I want to see if you have questions that might help clarify understanding. Uh, do you have any th thoughts or comments or questions? So in your handout, there is this little chart here uh, that is meant to kind of parallel uh, between Exodus and Genesis. And uh, there's two. Uh, one is place, a union of heaven and earth. In Genesis, it's the Garden of Eden. In Exodus, it's the tabernacle, later the temple. Then the people, there is a union of divine and human. Um, and how is that done? Well, the image of God, the carriers of the image of God are Adam and Eve as royal priests. But later, it's the Aaronic priesthood, Aaron and his family. So you see at the bottom of this slide here, that there are several things that priests do. One is worship. Uh, they give praise uh, to God. Second is representation, where priests are representing God to the people and representing people back to God. And all of this is reflected in the garments. And you'll see here in a moment when I bring up what uh, the high priest looks like, the names of the uh, tribes are on his heart. And in his clothing, he is representing the glory of God to the people. 
So when you think even to this day and age, why priests and pastors sometimes wear robes that have a lot of symbolism on them uh, in high church type denominations, uh, there is all kinds of symbolism from uh, the stoles that are worn to the images on the stoles, to the colors of the stoles that they wear at various times uh, during the year. All of this is kind of a carryover from this uh, uh, period of time in Exodus where it's made to uh, inspire people as they look at it, and it's meant to give respect to the individual that is the priest who is uh, representing them before God and pronouncing a blessing upon people uh, because they uh, have that uh, special calling to be a priest. So um, perhaps you've had experience in different uh, opportunities where a pastor or a priest is wearing different garments uh, that uh, in some ways seems to be so foreign to our everyday experience, especially with the dress down tendency uh, currently, even within the business world. So um, some churches, though, still hold that as a way of helping people to connect to God. And that's mm -hmm. true with a lot of the stained glass that's in, uh, in churches. It tells a story. When you look at windows, it tells a story of many of the big stories in the Bible. Um, other symbols, whether it's a Trinity type um, uh, symbol or uh, whether it is the ichthus uh, that looks like a fish, all kinds of different things, or the chi rho, which are um, uh, two Greek letters. There's a lot of symbolism in some churches. And I, if you've ever had an opportunity to walk through some of the um, more elaborate cathedrals uh, in and around our area, you'll find a lot of the ongoing legacy of what is introduced here in Exodus. Um, any thoughts, Ed? Yep. I mean, I grew up with that mm -hmm. in, the, in the Lutheran church. Yeah. The, the pastor always wore a robe and whatever season it was, it was, um, the stole was a certain color and the altar was too. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a kid growing up in, with that, how did, what impression did that make on you, Beth? I mean, it, it's, I mean, he was important, but I mean, it was like still you know, God was important. I mean, that was always the emphasis and stuff, but I mean, I mean, I learned a lot through my great aunt because her husband was a minister, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, it was just, I just accepted it, you know, it was like, you know, this is how church is. The reason I ask that is because I think you could take it one of two ways. So, you could see that as a window into a lot of symbolism by what they wear and the and the different stoles and stuff, or you could take it as um, we're better than you uh, because we wear all of these garments, that type of thing. Oh no, I never. Okay, I never thought that. I just okay. thought you know, that's what they do. That's what yeah. how it is. <laughs> Just you know what that it. strikes me about um because I grew up Catholic that um you were separated from God still because they were the only ones that had that line, like the priest, the high priests, and you had to confess your sins to them, not directly to God, because mm -hmm. you know, you didn't have direct communication with them. And it's funny that they didn't even, you know, do a thing about the second covenant. <laughs> That, that now we can go in his presence yeah. it's kind of funny like it's stuck back in the the old way of thinking i think but well what could have started out as a very good thing especially 
during periods of time where people um, were illiterate even, um, you know, to look at the priest, to look at the stained glass was a way of learning the stories and having them visually reinforced. Um, mm -hmm. when, when it becomes a means of control or power influence over people, um, then I think it's lost its purpose a little bit. But um, but you can see where some of this uh, comes from. Uh, here, right here in Exodus, there, a lot of this was instituted uh, not long after um, they were delivered out of Egypt. And it was carried on uh, as long as there was a standing tabernacle or a standing temple, priests wore um, specialized garments uh, that set them apart from the lay, uh, uh, the laity. So um, we'll see that in a picture here in a moment. A other questions or comments? So um, this is one visual of uh, a, a high priest garment where he's wearing the ephod, the breastplate, the turban, those type of things. Uh, this here over here would be a type of garment that would be used in the daily service in the tabernacle. So there is kind of like, um, I don't know if this is a good way to put it or not. Um, like in the military, you have you have your uniforms, but then you have your 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 dress uniforms for spe special occasions and that type of thing. Does that make mm -hmm. I, I think uh, your dress blues or other things like that. That if on special occasions it is set apart even more. And so when the high priest will wear these garments. Um, it is reflective of the very important role he plays on Yom Kippur. So mm -hmm. I sent this out uh, to you. It was attached to this week's handout. I, now, in chapter 28, uh, I want you to take note of some of the things and how they are represented here. So, <laughs> excuse me. When you're beginning here, uh, we'll start with uh, some of the things that you find in chapter 28. So these verses here, like the breastplate, verses 17 through 21, uh, is found in Exodus chapter 28. And you can see that up here at the top. Um, mm -hmm. And this uh, here uh, represents different things. So uh, let's begin and kind of work our way kind of counterclockwise around. So here you have uh, a gold plate that is worn on uh, the head of the priest, and this gold plating uh, as part of the turban. And as you move down, what you have, look at verses 9 and 10 in chapter 28 here. It says, take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. So that's what we have on the top of his shoulders here. Six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones the way a gem cutter engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in gold uh, filigree settings and fasten them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron is to bear the names on his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. May gold filigree settings and two braided chains of pure gold like a rope and attach the chains to the setting. So that's what he's talking about in this picture here up at the top of his shoulders and through the breastplate area. Now on the breastplate is 12 precious stones. And you'll see that if you go down to verse 17. It says here, then mount four rows of precious stones on it. In the first row, there shall be ruby, topaz, and beryl. In the second, turquoise, sapphire, and emerald. And third row, uh, Janus and agate, and agate and amethyst. And in the fourth row, 
uh, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper. So what you have here is four rows with three stones in each row. And they are very specific um, because they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And what we find here is the um, also in this description is uh, not only the materials, but something else that is quite important. If you come down to verse 30, somewhere hidden in this breastplate is what is called the Urim and the Thummim. Take a look at verse 30. Um, verse 29, that'll begin the paragraph. Whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breastpiece of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. Also put the Urim and Thummim in the breastpiece so that they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus, Aaron will always bear the means of making decisions for the Israelites over his heart before the Lord. So the Urim and Thummim, uh, it is believed, are kind of like two special stones that's hidden within the breastplate. And it is thought that in some way, God used those stones, whether it is they light up or there's a lot of mystery to this. We don't really know how it gives wisdom to Aaron, but these two things that are mentioned here are a part of, of uh, a way that God enables him to use wisdom as a priest. So if you uh, look this up, it's mentioned uh, some other places in the Old Testament, but it is really one of the most mysterious things that you'll run across. Uh, why is it hidden, number one? And number two, how does it work to provide wisdom for Aaron? Then it goes on and you have a girdle or a sash, and then you have the uh, incense fragrance uh, that is used that he would carry. Uh, priests in funerals even today still use this idea here where they'll go around the casket with incense. Um, you have fine linen. And um, then as you move up the other side, an interesting feature here is uh, found in verse 35. So if you come down to verse uh, 35, it says uh, here, well, I'll begin with verse 33. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. The gold bells and the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe. Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he will not die. So there's a lot of symbolism in this. When people hear the bells as he moves about in the holy place, they know he's still safe. You don't hear any bells. You wonder, has God pronounced judgment upon him? So then you move on up, and uh, it talks about the ephod being embroid uh, embroidered rather with blue and purple and gold and so forth. Um, so I found this picture helpful to visualize um, what chapter 28 and then chapter 39, which repeats this all over again, uh, what, it, what it's talking about. So let me stop there and see if you have some observations. Anything about this picture or? Are those the pomegranate fruit? that's hanging from his garment? That's a good question. Uh, pomegranate, uh, as in the fruit, uh, I would assume so. I mean, that's the term that is that used. Just sounds, that just sounds weird, but I guess. Yeah. No, the Urim and the Thummim? Yeah. Is that the same as the lots that they cast? Uh, it, it works like that. In some other passages, 
um, the Urim and the Thummim are to help make decisions. At this point in Exodus, we're not told that yet, though. All we're told is somehow this is part of uh, how God is communicating to the priest. So it's not the same as in the New Testament when they're looking for a new <clears throat> apostle, then they're no, casting the, lots. It's not the same. No, it's not, not in the New Testament. No. no. How there was the casting of lots when it fell on Stephen to replace Judas in the book of Acts, that's not this. But I, the technique that they used to ch uh, choose uh, the replacement for Judas, uh, it's worth some research. I'm not sure I know off the top of my head. So, other com uh, comments or observations or questions? Why did they swing the incense around a casket at a Catholic funeral? Okay, do you have an answer on that at all? Did you learn that in catechism at all? I did. I did learn that, um, but um, mainly, I I was reinforced when I lived in Asia. Um, they like the service for the hungry ghost. They use incense because it can go into spirit. That's how they believe that it's pleasing to God, and in the Catholic Church, it, it is as well. Mm -hmm. was, okay. I think incense in general, even in the tabernacle, is the idea of a sweet savor before the Lord. Now, that's mm -hmm. the altar of incense. Now, mm -hmm. what you're asking, though, is in relationship uh, to funerals. Why does the priest walk around the casket and, and do the incense? In some ways, um, I think it's part of the doctrinal uh, beliefs of the Catholic Church that the priest really does assist the saints into the presence of God. So it's reflected even okay. in the prayers. Um, let, let's assist, um, I'm just going to throw a name out there. Let's assist Francis on her way to God with our prayers. Um, and so if you've been a, a part of a Catholic funeral, um, there will be prayers that are read, and um, and then usually there's some type of um, a, a response by the people that are present there. So the priest will say something, and uh, then there will be a response that is usually known by heart uh, by um, uh, Catholic individuals. But the purpose behind it is um we're assisting our loved one into the presence of god so that's I, not only true at the church but some of those prayers are said at the graveside uh as well um one of the prayers is let perpetual light shine upon whoever it may be this uh, this individual so mm -hmm. it's this idea that the priests still play a critical role in mediating um, on behalf of individuals, especially at the time of their departure from this earth. So I would think that the incense is kind of built upon this, again, Old Testament imagery here that is used. But I, you know, next time I'm driving the hearse and I have a priest in in the vehicle with me, I'll ask him specifically, what is the symbolism of the incense around the, the casket? Yeah. Yeah. And they swing it to keep it smoking or keep it going? Why do they? Well, yeah. What's it fascinating? I don't know what the ingredients are that begins the smoke that comes out of the sensor. Uh, but, you know, the swinging of it allows the incense to continue to, to smoke out. out uh come out of the the yeah. scepter or whatever it's called so any other insights on that or comments i i i did not grow up catholic so i i don't know 
a lot of the theology behind some of these things, but the best answer I can give you is that much of the Catholic sanctuary is set up and it has a lot of reflective elements that go all the way back into the tabernacle and temple of the Old Testament. Um, that is also true. Do, 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 do any of you have relatives that were um, were in the Masons or are in the Masons? Yeah. Okay, so their whole protocol is built upon uh, Solomon's temple and uh, the imagery that comes out of Judaism. So uh, I remember on one occasion, this years and years ago, uh, I was going to do a Passover Seder and Pat uh, Mann, uh, who is a, a, really involved in the Masons, says, I can get you the high priest garment and you can wear that. And do you remember that, Esty? I wore that on, on an occasion where, and I mean, it looked like this picture here. So the Masons a lot, uh, draw a lot of heavy symbolism in that. And if you've ever heard a Masonic um, part of a funeral, a lot of it is built on verbiage that comes out of this whole Old Testament setup. Now, there's more to it than that, I think, and you'd have to be a Mason to kind of learn it because there's different degrees of Masons that you work up. Um, and the higher it goes, the more secret it becomes. And if yeah. you, uh, you know, if you watch um, a couple of the Nicolas Cage movies on National Treasure and stuff, there's a lot of Masonic symbolism in those movies as he's in search of treasures that were hidden below the Liberty Bell and all this and that. These are good movies, but I mean, so anyways, um, symbolism plays an important part. Even within the Masons, you'll see the compass uh, emblem and that type of thing. All of that kind of goes back to this idea of building uh, the temple um, and, and that type of thing too. So well, the mm -hmm. Russian Orthodox, the priests, the way they wear things, what is that related to? I couldn't tell you. I I would imagine that any Orthodox type of expression of Christianity builds a lot on mm -hmm. these images. But what their special, unique uh, elements are, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I can't comment on. I don't know in particular about the Russian Orthodox, but... Ask my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions or comments? So the whole idea, I think, overall is through the tabernacle, through the priesthood, um, you're trying to restore the paradise that was lost. And just a couple of interesting things here. When you read, so go over to chapter 39 now of Exodus. There's uh, terms that are used here, which is interesting. So chapter 39, verse 32. So here you see in chapter 39, there's the ephod and the breastplate and priestly garments restated all over again. And then when you get down to verse 30, um, 42, 32 and 42, so 32 says, so all the work on the tabernacle, the tent and meeting was completed. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 42, the Israelites had done all the work just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. So what's fascinating in the Old Testament um, is this word completed is the same word that is used back in Genesis 2-1 when God completed his creation. It's a Hebrew word, kalah, and it's the idea, again, of the big creation is reflected in the tabernacle. So, um, and this whole idea is 
paradise can be restored uh, as they continue to carry out their role, not only the priesthood found in Aaron, but a kingdom of priests, as we saw in the video as well. So when you get up to chapter 40, then, which is the last chapter in the book of Exodus, finally the tabernacle is set up. So all of this has been uh, manufactured, and then it is finally set up, and then notice what happens in verse 34. Down in verse 34, what you have is the glory of God. It says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the, uh, if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel during their travels. So these are people that are on the move. They are moving from a place of slavery to a place of freedom, from a place of uh, in, enslavement to a place of owning a, a, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. So you can see here on this particular slide, the book of Exodus then sets the stage for the other stories that are going to follow in the Old Testament. So as they, they exit out of Egypt, uh, they commemorate that exit yearly in the Passover, and uh, they are searching for a kingdom. Well, that never fully comes to pass, on, and what you find is this idea and expectation is still prominent into the New Testament. What Matthew does in his gospel is he draws a parallel uh, to Moses. Jesus is paralleled with Moses. So Moses goes to Mount Sinai. Jesus is the, in the, uh, communicates this new uh, law uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. And and then in three of the Gospels, all of them but John, the Lord's Supper is tied to the Passover, and even Jesus' death is modeled on the sacrifice of a lamb. Mm -hmm. And remember John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Later, Paul will use the same Exodus story uh, as he compares a person going through the waters of baptism to Israel passing through the sea. And then finally, uh, the author of Hebrews uses this image extensively in uh, the letter that he wrote. So all of this comes back later, and um, it, it, it pops up throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. So as we wind down our thoughts tonight, I, I, I do want to say that the book of Exodus is, it's fascinating, but it's very challenging. There's a lot more to it than the Sunday schools type of stories that we teach kids. Um, you know, the giving of the Ten Commandments, the parting of the waters, that type of thing. It's a very richly layered book that it represents multiple traditions by virtue of the fact that you see repetition in the book of some of the same things that were said before. What you have is a very important piece of literature that will, um, will influence Judaism through the rest of the uh, Old Testament, and it will have an impact upon Christianity as well through some of its symbolism on on into our own day and age. So uh, some of those churches that still use a lot of the imagery here, you, you find in what is called uh, high churches uh, that, that will use a lot of written prayers, a lot of um, stained glass, a lot of symbolism, 
including the robes that the priest or the pastor would wear, that type of thing. So you can see this book is not just something that's in the dustbins of history. It, it is something that continues to have influence down to our own day and age. I think if we can take away the big picture, what I think we can find is that in spite of some of the troubling chapters that you'll find in the book of Exodus, like God wanting to wipe out his people that he just delivered out of Egypt and other things like that. Um, what you'll find is this becomes in many ways an ongoing influence of inspiration to people that have been impressed for thousands and thousands of years. It's interesting that in the Black church, the book of Exodus plays a critical role in the life of the Black church. Why? They found many parallel situations to the Israelites. And what happens in a Black church is you'll notice that the pastors are often given elevated titles, bishop, uh, different things like that. That's kind of reflected all the way back into there is a deliverer that's coming, this man or woman, primarily in a black church, um, it, it's usually a man, but sometimes it's a woman too, that represents God's desire to deliver people, even in this day and age. So you can follow this probably in a number of different paths, depending on which which route you want to go with it. But anyways, um, hopefully you learned some things over the last uh, few weeks and, you know, continue to read it. And you might notice things that we didn't even bring up in our study. I'm sure there's tons of stuff that I overlooked or missed. So any thoughts, comments, or questions as we we finish this study up tonight. If not, have a good couple of weeks off, and then I will email you and let you know um, our next study, okay? And um, in the meantime, just enjoy the holidays and enjoy being with your family and uh, you know, hope it's full of wonderful memories for you. So stay safe on the roads. Yeah, yep. be safe on the yeah. roads too. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Yeah, thank Merry you. Christmas. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to, all of you. to you. And uh, just a reminder that this Sunday at church, we're going to have some refreshments following the service. So hope you guys can stick around and we can enjoy uh, some time together before we head at our separate ways so all right have a good evening everybody okay all right. Good night. take care